एक्सेस मार्केटिंग एन के टी सिक्स टू फाइव लेक्चर नंबर थर्टी एट Assalamu alaikum khawatin hazrat this is Wasim Hasan your course instructor and i welcome you to lecture number 38 of services marketing mkt 625 at the virtual university of pakistan i am going to continue with the um, distribution channels the topic i was talking about toward the end of the previous lecture we all know by now that uh, there are uh, a few strategic formulations available to service sellers to come up with the right channels that they need to have to sell their services and we also know that uh, no company would like to stake one site one service company everybody wants to grow and expand and whenever there's a question of growth and expansion channel management or for that matter distribution management takes on added significance so in other words with the growth and expansion could we have to look into the factors of managing the channels in a way that we as service providers could are in a position to fulfill our purpose achieve our goals there are two different components of distribution management to which service sellers could have to give a lot of serious consideration the one is the organizational structure and the other is economies of scale plan I'm going to talk about these two components the one by one let us start with the organizational structure we know what a structure is all about it basically is a formal network of relationships among employees in order to achieve the goals of the organization meaning the employees they should be working in a way with the help of those relationships as a team that the goals of the organization stand fulfilled this is the simplest the possible definition of the organizational structure and we also know that we have to have the right design which offers us different choices in order to pick the right structure that we should have and a structure is a function of so many different factors of which the general environment and task environment are important I'll talk very briefly about these two environments but before that let me tell you there are different kinds of goals with which organizations could have to fulfill and in a macro way those goals could be meeting expectations of the customers meaning fulfilling their demands coming up with their requirements achieving a decent level of profitability and a return on investment achieving high efficiency and exercising controls so that managers could are in a position to achieve the results they envisage now coming to environments the general environment as you know is the one which comprises of a few important factors like the socio economic environment the socio political environment the technological environment now given the level of economy the social values the system and the availability of technology in the marketplace organizers or managers from that point of view come up with a structure which is well suited or the best suited to the organization it however is the task environment which takes on added importance here because we are going to talk in terms of uh, distribution management a task environment could basically is a set of all those forces or factors or elements or things which have something to do with with employees of the company or the organization the distributors franchisees licensees suppliers customers and even competitors now you can well imagine could by talking about all these factors could i have covered so many areas and could which should take us to one single point of convergence that could we have to look at the nature of the organization and the nature of the service that we are selling and relate that with all those factors that i've just talked about and could we shall know what should be the most suitable structure for the organization now talking about types of structures could we all know by now that could we have centralized structures and we have decentralized structures 
centralized structures are the ones in which top managers could have most of the authority, and they are the ones who call the shots. And the centralized structures are suitable to those businesses which basically opt for the position of cost efficiency and high productivity. For the simple reason that uh, the service product is very highly standardized and uh, it requires steps which are pre-established, there should be no deviation from those steps day in, day out. And at the same time, the outcome is predictable. In other words, we're not dealing with a situation where could we customize services for our customers. And therefore, could we opt for a centralized structure of management. Do not lose sight of the fact that we are talking about distribution management, where the objective is to learn how effective we can be as managers when it comes to fulfilling goals of the organization as they relate to distribution, because it is all about selling through different sites. And like I said, no company should be just one site and one service company. Businesses could have to be multi-site, multi-services companies, and therefore a higher and higher level of significance that goes to the concept of distribution management. Talking about um, decentralized structure of the organization, well, this is the one which is opted by those that opt for customization and the functional quality because of the fact that they might have to make different strategic moves for different sites. When I talk about different sites, it may not essentially mean sites within one particular city or one particular geographical region. It could be international. And uh, taking the example of a five-star hotel, which is a multi-site, multi service company, we can take a look at why there is a need for a decentralized structure. For the simple reason that there could be many strategic implications in terms of pricing and other decisions in relation to the business that a five-star hotel, which happens to be a part of an international chain, has to achieve and do. There are so many different service products which are being offered within that the one giant facility, like different kinds of restaurants. I mean, in addition to boarding and lodging facilities, which any hotel has to provide. This hotel also has maybe a gym and a swimming pool and a business center, a convention hall, and facilities available for weddings and related functions. So just look at the enormity and the complexity of the functions involved the managers of this organization would not like to run back and forth about taking decisions and guidance and cues from managers, meaning their superiors and supervisors sitting somewhere else. The authority for making decisions up to a certain level has to be vested into the local management. And I think that this exemplifies the need for a decentralized structure. There could be so many other examples uh, within the area of customization and the position of uh, functional quality that uh, the multi-site facilities could have to have a certain level of independence and autonomy in order to be efficient and effective. However, this should not be the case with highly standardized service products because then there's going to be a lot of confusion about something which has to be highly predictable and highly standardized and has to be offered and delivered in just about the same manner every time it is sold to any customers. The implication here is to go for kind of an organizational structure which is best suited to the purpose of the organization so that we can achieve the organizational goals. So much about the, the organizational structure, and uh, we don't really have to get into too many details, uh, assuming um, very confidently that uh, you fully understand uh, what structures are all about. Let us now move our attention toward economies of scale plan. What is economies of scale? It basically is uh, the cost advantages associated with operations. And the fact is that uh, the economies result when you produce in large quantities, 
you buy in large quantities, and also you extract the best possible and the most effective output from the collective skills and knowledge of your employees and your colleagues. That also amounts to getting economies of scale. I mean, when we talk about uh, division of labor and specialization, I think it becomes very obvious that uh, we can and rather we should achieve economies of scale because of the collective pool of specialization. Regardless of what the level is, it may be at a low level or at the lowest level, but the fact remains that the people work as a well-oiled machine, giving you the kind of output which is predicted and which is wanted. Economies of scale can um, offer themselves in three different forms. In the first place, economies must be achieved when it comes to the financial area. Well, it is because of the multi-sign and multi-service strategy and because of growth and expansion that the companies are in a position to make decent levels of profitability. And companies, ideally, they should make profits to the point that they are able to plow those profits or a portion of those profits could back into financing more operations, meaning putting more money into upcoming sites and making investments into improving systems and procedures and providing your people with all those technological support, which I talked about in relation to people and training and development. So economies of scale can become very apparent in the area of finance when we make good profits. It reduces dependence of businesses on outside sources for financing. If a company is not making enough profits to be able to plow back a portion of the back into financing further operations, that is something that has to be analytically looked into because it may be due to something else. It may not be just because of bad distribution or bad practices when it comes to the managing channels. It could be other areas, and that calls for looking into the whole thing very incisively. Getting back to economies of scale, in the area of marketing, you will agree with me that uh, the businesses do not really have to invest over and over again in order to make their service product and the company known to the segments of uh, the population they are approaching. It owes to the brand loyalty. And before that, the brand awareness, of course. You create a high level of awareness and then brand loyalty because of offering good service to your customers. So when you expand, the marketing implication is that you do not have to spend money just in order for you to be known in the marketplace. You already have your existence, and customers and public at large know who you are, and hence economies. The third area in which economies of scale they become very apparent is operations. And when it comes to operations, we can achieve economies in three different I would say the sub areas. The economies of scale could be service specific, could be site specific, and could also be firm specific. Let us try to understand what this specificity is all about. Well, service specific economies come by way of division of labor and specialization, which I just talked about a few moments ago. Because of the fact that people know what is to be done, and because of the high level of predictability of the outcome, the people are in a position to specialize the tasks they are performing. This specialization becomes a collective pool and hence a great strength for the company because everybody knows what is to be done and every step is taken in just about the most standardized way. It offers economies to the company not only in one side, but in all the sides where the company is operating. That becomes part of the culture of the company. And you know the ultimate goal of developing a culture is to be customer focused and service focused. So it owes to this specialization and division of labor that we are in a position to fulfill those orientations which are the hallmark of services marketing.
Let us now try to understand what um, service-specific economies are. Well, these occur when a company adds one more service or more services, especially peripherals, to the site it already has. And it basically is the multi-service strategy which offers companies this kind of economies of scale. Because of the fact that the companies are in a position to offer peripherals which could be very attractive, and the fact that investments could already have been made into the capital equipment, the site, and the total the physical environment, it all depends upon the ability of the management to come up with the kind of peripherals to which they can add in order to get these economies. But they just look at a company which sells just about two or three services versus another one which sells like seven or eight ones. Both have uh, the similar kinds of physical evidence, but it is the collection of services or the extension of services, the meaning the core product into so many different peripherals that the company having a wider extension is in a better position to achieve higher economies of scale. And like I told you earlier, it is basically cost advantages associated with operations and therefore it has to be viewed in a very competitive context. It is something which is one of the elements of sustainable competitive advantage. Because of this, you are in a position to outcompete the other players. And it all owes to the ability of the management of the company to come up with the range they are dealing with. The third type of economies of scale is firm-specific economies. Well, these are a combination of the two that I've just talked about, the meaning the site-specific and the service-specific economies along with an additional economy, which is the size of management. I think uh, that you will agree with me that a given size of management is uh, the optimal for a certain number of sites. It is quite very difficult to give you a formula about uh, what should be the strength of uh, the top management versus the number of sites or the number of employees working in those sites. But it becomes obvious to the company whether or not the size of top management is compatible with the output it is receiving or the revenues it is generating. In addition to satisfying their customers, which of course is one of the top, top objectives of the company. So in other words, we can say that you need a certain size of the top management, whether you have three sites or you have seven sites. And it quite be very well possible that the strength of management that you need for three sites may also be suitable to seven sites. And it is here that companies should strive to maintain the most optimal balance between the size of the management and the number of sites or the quantum or the enormity of the operations. We have to look into so many different complexities of the operations and therefore we get into the kind of structures which are most suitable, like I said. It all depends on the volume of business and the nature of service that you are selling. You might like to divide with one particular market, which could be just one city into three different sections putting each section under the one middle or one top manager. This is just one example. And all I'm saying is that uh, the relationship has to be optimal because it should optimize the efficacy of the existing management in relation to a certain size of the organization. Another uh, the economy which uh, companies can uh, attain is from outsourcing. If uh, outsourcing uh, the part of your operations to another firm could be beneficial for the company, then one should not hesitate doing so as long as it offers economies of scale. However, if outsourcing is going to be as expensive or as uh, complex as your own operations could be, it is a better option to stick with your own operations and keep everything under your own supervision and control. Now, 
after having learned what should be the structure like and what are the economies to which we can attain by expanding and by growing, I think it becomes very obvious the kind of management for distribution that we should have. After we have determined the kind of management we should put in place, the foremost challenge which really looks into the eyes of all managers is that of quality. Growth and expansion should never take place at the cost of quality, the meaning there must not be any compromise on quality because it is against the fundamentals of the service-oriented delivery. And therefore, we should make um, every effort to see to it that uh, quality is not compromised. Because when quality is compromised, your customers are going to be dissatisfied. And in the first place, what is going to happen is you will lose sales. And whenever there is a decline in sales, it is a stark reflection of the fact that defections already have taken place. When defections take place, it becomes an even bigger challenge for the company. Because staging a recovery at that particular point in time, when you are losing customers and the quality is going down, it becomes even more difficult than putting everything together in the first place. Creating a product and establishing the standards for a high level of quality, preparing people and doing all those things which I've been talking about in relation to all the elements that minimize gap one, gap two, and gap three are going to be no good if quality goes down because that is not going to be a reflection of a customer focused approach. So what is it that we should do? Well, the answer lies in going for a very systematic and very well-planned and a thought-through growth and expansion of the process. You must never push growth. You should let growth come your way and then expand things in a very organic way so that you do not lose the fundamentals in terms of quality. And those companies which are in a position to develop the kind of culture which is customer-focused, service-focused, and also employee-focused are the winners. Because these are the three focus areas that really spin you into the winner's circle. And that is something which you have to keep in mind. Develop a culture which follows these elements and these three areas of focus. And when you have that kind of culture, the chances are your financial results will be a reflection of that. In the meaning, you don't really have to worry about the financials in terms of profitability, return on investment, and the market valuation, stock value, so on and so forth. Even if you happen to be a very small company, you do not really have to worry about the profitability because your customers are satisfied and you're doing everything possible that we have learned so far in order to minimize all the gaps that we have learned by now. And therefore, growth must be a very systematic and well-planned effort. This is uh, all about uh, distribution management uh, in brief words. So uh, I would like to uh, give you a summary of uh, the area of distribution uh, which we have learned with the help of uh, almost uh, the two lectures. But we know what distribution channels are and we also know the kind of uh, the options we have for to go exclusive or to go selective or to go uh, the multi-channel and so on and so forth. All that depends on the nature of the service and the circumstances that present themselves in the marketplace. And that is something which is part of the overall general environment. But once you have taken a good stock of the general environment, you get down to the task environment, which is a function of different factors, like I um, told you earlier. Your customers, your distributors, the nature of service, and your competitors, and... Um, franchises and licensees and everybody who affects the business and everybody who works for the business. So you will go for um, the option which is most suitable to the business and once you have uh, pinpointed that, then you will follow the right strategic move. Whether you should go for a multi-site 
with a strategy or a multi-site, like the multi-service strategy, or a multi-site and multi-segment strategy, or whatever could be the combination in relation to your requirements as they satisfy the, your customers. We also learned the concept of franchising, which is a very interesting concept and uh, a vehicle which really gives an impetus to growth. We can acquire the fast growth, but not fast growth at the cost of quality, like I told you. It gives us the fast growth because we have somebody else invest into the capital items and bring their own management that already are experienced in a similar line and give them our own standards and specifications to follow not only specifications about your operating procedures, but also the physical evidence. They have to create the physical environment just in line with your specifications so that there are no deviations. We also looked into the advantages and disadvantages of which franchising carry with it as a concept. And we learned that the advantages outweigh the disadvantages um, of uh, the concept for the simple reason that uh, we can grow and uh, the concept is risk free almost risk free for the franchisee because what you have to keep in mind is that the chances of failure are very low in terms of uh, running a franchise because you are running a successful business format and therefore, the concept it works very well when it comes to, in particular, the cost efficiency position. And uh, you can expand into the multi-site um, uh, strategy. Uh, you can add services and you can become kind of a multi-site, multi-service company. And what we have learned that we can achieve economies. And we achieve economies because we have a strong brand. And uh, that brand has uh, a very strong following a good franchise, the loyal in the customers, and that gives us economies of scale because we do not really have to invest into advertising as much as we would have to if it was an independent business. And then we also have learned the concept of distribution the management, which must take into consideration two important components. One is that of organizational structure, and the other one is that of economies of scale. After having learned all about the distribution and distribution management, I now would like to switch over to the next area of learning, which is about managing demand and supply. And this is something which I did talk about, though very briefly, in some other context. But I would like to talk about this particular concept in a little detail. Uh, in this lecture and also in the next one so that, uh, that we do really understand and appreciate why is there a need for balancing demand and supply? Why is it that we have to shift demand to certain other periods and why is it that we have to expand or alter our supply patterns in order to bring about maximum optimization of our operations? I think uh, that we all know that um, Services are uh, perishable, not that I think, that I'm convinced that uh, we are quite very sensitive to the fact that uh, demand in terms of a service product occurs real time. It is not like a tangible product for which you know the demand level. You produce goods, store them, and sell them in the marketplace. And uh, whenever there is an upsurge of demand, uh, you supply those goods from your reserves or stocks and distribute those in the marketplace, making sure there is no shortage. If there is one, it is a topic of some different kind of a discussion that I would like to confine to the topic that I'm talking about. And uh, the importance lies in understanding whenever demand takes place for a service, it is produced then and there. It cannot be stored. It can be stored, you see, in certain uh, contexts, which I talked in relation to electronic channels, but mostly services cannot be stored, cannot be inventoried, and therefore 
the whole thing is very real time. Because of it being real time, it is quite very difficult for service sellers to estimate the level of demand. At times, you know, the demand exceeds supply, resulting in sellers turning away their customers. And at times, demand is short of supply, thereby resulting in unused or unutilized capacity. And the fact remains that both situations are negative situations because in the first situation, you are turning your customers away and depriving yourselves of the added revenues which could have fallen your way. And that gives you some insight into the fact how to expand your capacity to be able to sell all that which you can. And the other situation in which you have underutilized capacity is even worse because that might take you into an outright loss situation. The fact is demand fluctuations are different for different industries and different industries tackle fluctuations in different ways. Before I talk about how to manage the supply side and the demand side when it comes to optimizing our operations, let me tell you a couple of very simple but fundamental things about uh, this relationship. We have to understand the difference between the maximum capacity and optimal capacity. Well, the maximum capacity is the one which is very common sensible and it is stretching your capacity to the final limit. For example, if a plane has a capacity of 400 seats, that's the maximum capacity. And in this particular case, the airline would like to sell all those 400 seats. That's the maximum capacity. And in that particular case, that also is the optimal capacity. However, there are industries um, in which the optimal capacity can has a different meaning and connotation. In those industries uh, which are very sensitive to the, the quality of operations, the optimal capacity ranges between 70 and 90%. This is the rule of thumb, and this is the experience of service marketers all over the world. And this is what the textbook says. The optimal capacity is the one which sellers could mostly keep in mind because they have to estimate demand. And they estimate demand on the basis of optimal capacity, which they think should be the basis of their selling patterns. And the optimal capacity is the one at which the quality of service is the highest. That is something that we have to keep in mind. The focus on customer and quality is the optimal at a level of capacity, which is between 70 and 90 percent. It could be like 80 plus or close to 90. It still is optimal. But what happens is when you go to 100 percent, you do not stop selling. But it is something which starts presenting problems to the service sellers. And they find themselves kind of overstressed in terms of the delivery of the operations. And the service suffers, giving kind of a negative impact. Now, I'm not saying that we must stick to the optimal quality level. All I'm saying is that we should be able to make a distinction between the maximum capacity and the optimal capacity because demand fluctuations for different industries have got to be viewed from this particular perspective. The airlines industry, just to give you one example, should not be too much influenced by the optimal level of capacity, the meaning, the connotation of the optimal level. And they should try hard to go for the maximum capacity, yet maintaining the quality of service. However, Understanding and knowing that not all businesses are uh, equally challenged by these fluctuations, there are certain industries which are not as much affected by this connotation as uh, others could be. Um, and the examples I think I already have given you, telecommunications and utilities are the industries which could be uh, stressed in terms of the service to the maximum uh, capacity. However, the challenge remains that of estimating the optimal level of demand so that a business can prepare itself to productively meet it. This is the greatest challenge. Now, how do companies meet this particular challenge is uh, a kind of systematic approach, and there are four different steps involved uh, into it. 
The first one is uh, we have to determine the demand pattern. And the second one is that we have to assess the reasons or the causes of variations in demand. The third step is that we develop methods for managing supply. And the fourth one is that we develop methods for managing demand. As long as uh, we are in a position to uh, fully understand the essence of these four steps, uh, we are going to uh, be able to uh, prepare ourselves to productively meet the challenge of estimating the optimal uh, level of demand uh, for the industry that we are working for. Let us uh, talk about uh, what is really meant by determining the demand pattern. Well, every industry nowadays, or for that matter, every firm nowadays, is recording all the transactions that take place. With the support of uh, the information technology, we know how much could be sold during what time frame. So much so that we also have the data about customers, and we can relate all that data to the time frame in terms of seasonality and weather and the certain the parts of the year or to certain cultural religious uh, the occasions and so on and so forth so in other words what I'm saying is that uh, there has to be a way for companies in the services areas to use past trends and historical data to be able to come up with the demand patterns and uh, the ones they have identified the periods which are uh, characterized either by high demand or low demand, they are in a better position to make alterations in the supply pattern, meaning they are in a position to either expand the supply base or contract the supply base to be efficient and productive so that there is no loss of revenue or there is no wastage of resources. This is something that we have to determine. And we can do that with the help of, like I said, historical data. What really causes these variations, like I said, could be certain factors. And in case of an airline, I can give you the one example of a very sacred occasion, that is Hajj. Airlines do know the upsurge in demand right before the start and toward the end of the period. And therefore, they should be in a position to prepare themselves to meet that upsurge. Now, this is something which is known to the airlines. By the same token, other industries should also know the highs and lows of their sales patterns. Talking about hotels, for example, they do know when they have rush period and when they have lean period. It also depends on where the hotel is located. If the hotel is located in the northern areas of our market, then the summer season is the high season because of the obvious reasons. And then there is another upsurge which may not be as much as the one seen during summer is when there's a snowfall. The people like to go and see snowfall and cause a variation in the demand pattern for that particular hotel or all the hotels situated there. It is because of these fluctuations in demand patterns that we have to manage supply and demand. And after having understood how we can follow the demand patterns, which is extremely easy to gauge, and what are the, or uh, could be the causes uh, for those variations. We now move on to the third step, which is a very significant step because it deals with managing supply. And managing supply, as a matter of fact, is the, the biggest step that uh, we have to understand for this particular balance between supply and demand because it basically deals with altering the capacity of the company. You expand your capacity when you need more and you shrink your capacity when you need less because of the reason. You would like to add to your revenues by not turning any customers away and at the same time you would like to make sure there is no wastage. There are um, seven different ways of uh, the managing supply and those are you go for the part-time employees, you have your regular employees to work overtime, you 
use uh, the peak time operating procedures, you cross-train your employees and you increase customers' the participation into the uh, selling process, you uh, share uh, your facilities with others, and uh, you go for outsourcing. These are the seven steps that we have to understand the one by one as to how they affect or as to how they really could help the sellers could alter their capacity. Uh, let's start with uh, the part-time employees. Could you go for uh, the part-time employees could because there's an upsurge in demand and you have to cope with that. Part-time employees are uh, less expensive than uh, regular employees and therefore would offer you a cost advantage. Well, this is a, a very enticing uh, the kind of an advantage uh, which uh, sellers uh, really are uh, influenced by, but then you know, there are certain uh, disadvantages of this as well, which I'll be talking just in a moment. The most important thing here is that uh, in this kind of a situation, sellers uh, draw a baseline on the basis of their lean period. And lean period uh, is not really the, the optimal period, but it is the one on the basis of which sellers employ people. And the number of people is just about adequate to take care of business during lean periods. It is the high period when they have to employ more people in order to be able to cater to the needs of uh, additional customers, which they do not really want turned away. And for that, they go for these part-time employees. The biggest uh, the marketing concern about uh, part-time employees is that uh, they cannot be uh, as good at delivering the service as regulars are, and at the same time, they cannot be as productive you know, from the operations to the point of view. They are not as well-trained in most of the cases as regulars are, and therefore, they do not really have the kind of knowledge of the service and the overall business as regulars have. So where does the answer lie? The answer, as it looks obvious, does not really lie in not going for uh, part-timers. The answer lies in getting part-time employees and giving them adequate training. And not only adequate training, but also uh, giving them benefits which are almost as good as those of the regulars. There are uh, a few very successful international chains of uh, um, services in the world that really specialize in this particular area. And the fact is they offer exactly the same kinds of benefits to their uh, the temporary employees uh, as they offer to their regulars. Now, here, you as a seller they may not prefer to go for just about the same benefits um, as you could give to your regulars, but the importance really lies in giving them a level of benefits that can evoke their loyalty and they really start affiliating themselves with the place they are working for. They're getting into uh, incidents like theft and pilferage are a common place all over the world because they think they're not being treated very fairly. So from the operational point of view and uh, from the marketing point of view, you have to optimize the output given by these part-timers. And the only way is that you could employ them and train them adequately so that they understand your service and business as good as the regulars do, and they're also paid well. That's where the answer lies. The reason that I'm emphasizing the areas of training and development and also good benefits stems from the fact that uh, we are uh, knowledgeable about uh, closing gap three. And uh, if we really are sensitive to the people, the factor, then anybody can question why is it that uh, we have these part-timers who are not fully knowledgeable and who cannot really deliver the way uh, regulars do. Well, the answer lies in training them and uh, giving them adequate training and good benefits. The second a step in terms of managing supply is uh, to have regulars could work overtime. Now, this is an approach could, which works against uh, could, hiring the temporary people. It certainly has its advantages, could, but it also is not without disadvantages. The greatest advantage of this approach is that regulars are the ones could, who understand business, 
and uh, deliver the service according to customer's expectations and uh, the company uh, can have complete confidence in those people um, in terms of they are not letting the company down. But then these people are expensive because you have to pay overtime. And overtime is paid uh, internationally the one and a half times to twice as much as their basic salaries. Keeping that in view, it becomes a little costly and therefore employers might like to resort to part-timers. But the fact is, um, regulars uh, definitely are much better at delivering the service of high quality because they are more productive and the more knowledgeable of uh, all the steps that have to be taken to deliver that service. The trick lies in uh, having regulars work only that much which is uh, optimal for any human being and uh, add to that uh, the factor of uh, the part-timers who are also uh, the fully trained. Uh, there are uh, certain uh, situations in which uh, not always uh, regulars uh, have the uh, stamina and the energy to keep on working for unlimited hours. The third step uh, in terms of uh, the altering capacity or rather expanding capacity is to follow peak hour operating procedures. This implies that uh, you involve as many people for those operations within the company which really are on priority and uh, shifting those operations which are not really priority to the lean time of the day. Let us take the example of fast foods and uh, this will clarify what I'm talking about. You can shift the operation of uh, cleaning to the lean period of the day and uh, use all those people uh, for doing all those operations which are required to do uh, during peak hours because you want to serve as many customers as possible. This is a situation which uh, is characterized by more demand than supply and therefore you have to have everyone within the organization to do something which will enable you to serve all those customers who have come into the restaurant. You wouldn't like to see them turn away and that is why you shift certain operations to the lean period. This that has a negative side from the, the marketing point of view. Um, your customers that might start uh, taking your service as not of the full quality because uh, that they uh, might find things that which are a compromise on cleanliness. And uh, that when they start thinking in those lines, that, that, uh, that might initiate the start of a negative campaign on part of your customers. So what, you, what do you do at that particular moment? Do not compromise the quality of the core product for which they are there. That is number one. And number two is that you employ the techniques of uh, the perception management. The perception management basically is about uh, the waiting uh, customers who uh, think that the wait has been much longer than it actually is. If somebody is waiting in line for the last five minutes, it seems like, uh, you know, ages. So what is it that the companies can do is to alter the perception of the duration of that wait. And they create certain distractions which alter their perception. Things like music, television, etc. So when you employ these uh, techniques of perception management, what you are basically doing is taking the attention of your customers of those operations which have been shifted, like the cleaning operation. Let them look at the television and let them enjoy the music because as research reveals, the live music and um, on a television screen and um, uh, related um, entertainments have been found very encouraging and productive when it comes to the altering the perception of customers. So you can alter the perceptions while you expand your capacity by way of following the peak hour operating procedures. The next in line, which is about cross-training of employees. Cross-training of employees is something which will help you during the peak hours.
I think it goes without saying that because the people are knowledgeable of other areas which are not their specializations and still they are working to produce the service. In case that you have absenteeism or that you have excess demand, which basically is the issue, that you can use different people for doing those jobs which are the priority. There are so many advantages of this approach. In the first place, you become more productive, you expand your capacity, you follow the peak hour operating procedures, and then be in a position to serve all your customers, and that you also expose different people to different areas by enriching their experience into so many other tasks and areas. And when that happens, the people have a broader perspective. They have a bigger picture, which gives them a very analytical insight into the totality of company's operation to the benefit of the company and the customer at the same time. But this approach also is not without disadvantages. The greatest disadvantage is that the people may not be fully trained to undertake tasks in areas which basically are not theirs. I did talk about the concept of the division of labor and specialization. So if these people are not really specialists in doing jobs which are done by their colleagues, meant for doing those particular jobs, then there's a problem. So how do you counter that problem? Again, by training them. There has to be an adequate level of training and internal marketing in order to make everybody a specialist in areas which may not be originally theirs. That is where the trick lies. There are um, Three more steps that I need to talk about, and I will be talking about those in the next lecture. Let me give you a summary of uh, what I've talked about. It is um, all about managing supply and demand, and uh, the challenge which uh, sellers face is uh, their uh, ability to estimate the optimal level of capacity so that they can employ uh, a compatible um, number, quantity, and uh, the amount of resources they would not like to have uh, the resources uh, which go waste and at the same time they would not like to be short of those uh, which may cause their inability to serve all those customers who uh, want to come and buy their particular service. So given this uh, kind of uh, a fluctuation in demand patterns, the suppliers within the services areas could have to come up with a capacity level which um, is just about compatible with the total needs. And uh, coming up with uh, the uh, capacity levels compatible with the needs of the market is what we call managing supply. And managing supply is the third important step out of the four major steps that we have to understand when it comes to um, striking a balance between supply and demand. Now, number one, Estimate your the demand and look at the demand patterns. The number two, assess the causes of variation in demand. And number three, uh, manage supply. And number four is the manage demand. So we are right in the process of managing supply and the remaining three steps that we need to understand. I'll be talking about those in the next lecture. Thank you very much for your attendance and Allah Hafiz until then.